nice to be here this evening. And uh, I'd like to pray for a couple of different things. Number one, we're going to pray for all the people that are being affected by the terrible hurricane. Okay, because it's it's all over. Starting in Florida, one of Alabama, Georgia, we're talking South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, all of the above. Harley, do you have something that you'd like to share with us? What's up? Well, my grandpa's mom lives in Alabama. Oh, well, we'll pray for you. All of these people, okay, that they'll be safe, all right? All right, let's go before the Lord. Father, we come before you and we do lift up all these folks that are in harm's way with this terrible hurricane and uh, there's so much devastation that it's just almost hard to believe. So many, so many towns have been taken out and power down and just so many terrible things happening as a result of this and we just pray that you would protect the people of God, that you would just bring people some uh, comfort during this time, help them to get the help that they need, get their lives back on track. And we pray for those that have lost loved ones and homes and just all of that. We also want to lift up Rachel and ask you to touch her, Lord, and minister to her. And uh, you don't know how much you need somebody until they're not here. And so we pray that you bless our little sister just help her to feel better. And uh, just help us with the, the message this evening. It won't be up on the screen, but that's okay. Because we have Bibles. And so we give you honor. We give you thanks. I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross. That you would forgive our sins. That you would do a work of your grace in our lives. And just touch us by the power of your word. Your word is powerful. We love you. We give you honor and praise. And again, that you hide me behind the cross. That Jesus would be exalted and lifted up. So it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight we're in Daniel chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles or you have your cell phones, apps, whatever, I'm going to be teaching out of the New King James just to let you know. And uh, But it's Daniel chapter 3. And uh, last week <clears throat> when we got together we saw that Daniel had told Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the interpretation of it, and Nebuchadnezzar was pretty impressed by Daniel's abilities. And in chapter 2, we're going to look at two verses in chapter 2, because this is where Nebuchadnezzar was actually talking about the God of gods, okay? So some of you guys and gals probably remember that. So in chapter 2, in verse 46 and 47, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrated before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets. Since you could reveal this secret. And so then we found out that the king gave him gifts and all that. And so, which takes us up to, so he was doing pretty good at this point in the game, right? Acknowledging the Lord of heaven and praising God as the Lord of heaven. That was pretty good for Nebuchadnezzar to be doing that. So this evening, we're going to see that the king really gets off track. Again, okay? So, beginning in verse 1 <coughs> of Daniel <coughs> chapter 3, excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. <coughs> Sorry about that. Hopefully, the frogs are gone. <laughs> it says Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width. Six cubits. This thing was huge, okay? And it was a statue of himself. Okay, so he went from worshiping the real God, worshiping the God of heaven and earth and all of that, shifts gears, and then all of a sudden he builds a golden idol of himself. Okay? This guy just was not getting the program at all. 
So, I want to talk about that. And so, here it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, the satraps, the administrators, the governors, count, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time that you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Okay, so this guy had just a bit of an ego problem. <laughs> okay, and you, you might say that he wasn't conceited, he was convinced that he was a legend, okay? A legend in his own mind. We've all heard that term before. And he commanded everyone to come to the dedication ceremony. Everyone was told that the trumpets and other instruments blasted, that when the trumpets and other instruments were blasted, they should all bow down to the image, paying homage to the great Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what's really interesting is that if he had read the Bible, he would know that that wasn't a good idea, right? Because we all know in Exodus chapter 20, let's go over there for a minute. Exodus chapter 20, this is also known as the Ten Commandments, right? Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. And it says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth below, beneath, or that is in, in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, <clears throat> visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Then it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So, Nebuchadnezzar built this statue, this image of himself, and he told everybody that they had to worship it. Right? We just read that. Not a good idea. So, basically, he was, in effect, trying to make himself out to be a god mm -hmm. by erecting the statue of himself and ordering others to bow down to it. Now, what's interesting, it says that it was a gold, it was an image made of gold. Okay, we're going to be talking about that as well, because this is multi-billion dollar project here. Multi-million, multi-million, whatever. Okay, it was huge, made out of gold, wanted everybody to worship it, and in effect, they would be worshiping him. So, 
It's pretty crazy. Uh, this is also a type and symbol of what will take place in the future. Okay? So this was a historical thing that took place. However, it was a type and symbol of something that would take place in the future. When the Antichrist goes into the temple, makes an image of himself, erects a statue of himself in the rebuilt Jewish temple, commanding everyone to bow down to it. So we're going to do a quick glimpse of the Antichrist and his character just to see how these things kind of connect. Okay, so if you would go to Daniel chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 36 through 39. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 through 39, it says, and this is speaking of the Antichrist. It says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. Shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. It says, He shall regard neither the God of his father, so he will not regard the real God, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above all. Pretty intense. Then it says, but in their place, he shall honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones, and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Now, as you go to Matthew chapter 24, we're going to begin reading in verse 3, okay? Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 3. It says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will be cruel <coughs> one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, key verse there, <laughs> and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and I'm going to give you a, just a capsule of what's going on here. Because the Great Tribulation is going to be seven years long, right? We've heard that before. Mm -hmm. We are not in the Great Tribulation yet. Amen. How do I know that? Because we're still here. <laughs> okay. So, we are not in the Great Tribulation yet Amen. because we're still here. Okay. And I'm going to really play this out for you so that you can get the big picture of what is going on. Because here... 
in the midst of the Great Tribulation. So at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist is going to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple. We've talked about this before. They are actually making the, the instruments to do animal sacrifices again. If you go to Google and you type in Temple Mount Institute, you can actually see that. Wow. That they're actually making the knives, they're making the chalices, they're making all that stuff. It's really not going to make the people in PETA very happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay? People eating tasty animals. No, I'm kidding. That's again, that's people yeah. against Mine. the ethical treatment of animals. <laughs> that's what PETA stands for. Okay? But... I, I kind of joke around a little bit and say people are eating tasty animals because <laughs> no. some of us eat them. Anyway, so in the middle of the Great Tribulation, so three and a half years into the Tribulation, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and say, guess what? I've been letting you guys worship your God. You've been doing sacrifices to him. You've been doing all these kind of things. Not anymore. Now you're going to worship me. Wow. That's what the Antichrist is going to say. That's why he calls it the abomination of desolation. Okay? And it will set into play the most radical tribulation period that has ever existed in the history of mankind. Okay? And how do I know that? Because of what it says next. So, again... It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prof by Daniel the prophet, which we just read about, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, but let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Verse 21 is the kicker. It says, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Okay, so we read Matthew. Uh, we read Daniel. Now we're going to read Revelation. And most of you guys and gals have heard this before. I've taught on this before in the book of Revelation chapter 13. Okay, it says, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, right. and on his horns ten crowns, right. and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. The beast is the Antichrist, okay? The beast that comes up, rising up out of the sea. In other words, he comes from humanity, he's a human. But he's possessed by Satan. Okay. That is who the Antichrist is going to be. And it says that the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Gave him his power. His throne and great authority. Then it says. And I saw one of his heads. that has been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled. And followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon. Who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. 
42 months is three and a half years. Just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then it says, then he opened his mouth. So in the middle of the great tribulation, he's given power for 42 months, given authority to continue for 42 months. Then in the middle of the tribulation, verse 6, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. He blasphemed his name, his tabernacle, and all those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him, given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which were he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or, and, on their, and or on their foreheads, <clears throat> and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast <clears throat> or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him who has understanding Calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Okay, so again, this is a foreshadow. <coughs> when Nebuchadnezzar set up the image of gold, basically saying that he was God, and that he was going to rule and reign forever, uh, unfortunately he was taken out by the Medo-Persian Empire, right. and then by the Grecian Empire, and then by the Roman Empire. Okay, so he never made it to where he wanted to be. Okay? So we talked about that as well last week. And again, this is a foreshadow of what we talked about last week. Okay? So Nebuchadnezzar is a type and symbol of the Antichrist. Got it? Got it. All right. Picking it up in verse 6. And again, it says, And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the, se the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Okay, so in the same way as we just read about the Antichrist, there's going to be an image of the beast. And, you know, Iron Maiden made an album <laughs> called The Image of the Beast and it had 666 and it had all that stuff going on. They didn't quite get the whole story. Okay, because the whole world is going to worship the Antichrist, <coughs> whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Right? So people are going to be worshiping the Antichrist, just like they fell down, they were worshiping Nebuchadnezzar as the God, okay? The God. Wow. Pretty intense. Wow. Then in verse 8 of Daniel chapter 3, 
It says, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made, it, made a decree that everyone <coughs> who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Okay, so there were three men in the kingdom. And they were Daniel's buddies, remember? Mm -hmm. We talked about them last week. Yep. And it was, again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they stood up mm -hmm. and they said, we're not going to do it. We are not going to worship false gods. We worship the real God, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So, Nebuchadnezzar's losing his cookies at this point in the game. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in sympathy with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image that I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? He was just talking about the God <laughs> in chapter 2, remember? Oh yeah, you're the God, the God of Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, you're it. You're the God, you're the only real God. <coughs> now he's saying, I retract that statement, and I'm God, okay? And so, what's interesting is he says, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? What a cocky guy, right? He was just talking about the real God. Now he's going to find out who the real God is, right? Verse 16. These guys totally stood their ground. Totally stood their ground. They were not going to bow to this king. They were not going to suck up, okay, in this situation. Verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O oh king. But if not, let it be known to you, <coughs> O oh king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. My kind of guys. Amen. Bold as lions, right? Not backing down. Not, you know, not giving in at all. He said, we're not going to do it. So, <clears throat> we basically have a scenario here. Three Hebrew men... And these guys actually symbolize another part of the book of Revelation where it talks about that there's going to be 144,000 male Jews who keep the commandments of God, 
and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They're going to defy the Antichrist. Amen. 144,000. How many have heard of that term? 144,000. Well, guess what? The Jehovah's Witnesses are not them. <laughs> Amen. Just thought I'd throw that in. Because they say that. They say, we are the 144,000. <clears throat> and as soon as they went over 144,001, <laughs> then they had a problem. <laughs> okay? Right. But if he actually talks about who the 144,000 are, in the book of Revelation, we're going to be taking a look at that in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> so, we see a war of the wills. Nebuchadnezzar, standing for his own will, you shall bow to me in my image, you shall serve me and my gods. And the three Hebrews, who are sealed and protected by God, Amen. he's going to protect them. And again, one very interesting question has been posed. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you about the Great Tribulation and all that. Mm -hmm. Because where is Daniel during all of this? Mm -hmm. Okay? Daniel was not present. We can be certain that he was not bowing down to the image. Amen. Because Daniel is like a type and symbol of the church which I believe will not be around during the Great Tribulation. Amen. Okay, because he's not present here. And when the Great Tribulation happens, I personally believe that the real church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not going to be on the earth. Amen. I'm just letting you know. Right. Now, how can I say that? Because I got a little bit of backup. Okay? <laughs> you already knew that was coming, right? In our Revelation chapter 4, very powerful. This is, in, in my Bible, it talks about the throne of heaven. Okay, this is John, who was on the island of Patmos. And he's the one that got all the information that he shared in Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3. Okay, about the churches being on the earth. And this was, is what was going on with the churches. And all of that. And in chapter 4, this is really interesting. It says, after these things, after what things? Talking about the churches, okay? The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some are faithful, some not so faithful. <laughs> Just like we have today, okay? There are churches out there. Some are really into it for Jesus. Others are into it for themselves, Okay? That's the way it is, folks. Just letting you know. Okay, so in, you know, in Revelation chapter 3, it talks about different churches, different churches in church history, all of that, all the way up to, I believe, where we are today. But anyway, so here it says, in Revelation chapter 4, this is very powerful, it says, After these things I look, and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this and then he says immediately I was in the spirit and behold the throne set in heaven and one who sat on the throne so John is taken up like the church will be taken up, okay? This verse introduces the third major section of the book of Revelation. And as the verse begins and end, ends with, after these things, okay? After what things? After the church age. The previous two chapters are addressed to the church. And when the church's ministry and the witness is complete, the church will be taken up into heaven in the rapture. Jesus will say, come up here and we will ascend into heaven to be with the Lord. And this will immediately precede the events of the Great Tribulation. Very intense, okay? So... Now we're going to take a look at a couple other verses that we 
can see again. The dots connect, okay? So we're gonna check out how the dots connect. The rapture, all that, a lot of people go, oh, the word rapture is not in the Bible, and all of that, and I'm gonna just blow that whole concept away, Thank you. because I have documentation <laughs> of words that basically mean rapture, okay? So first off, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to go over there for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 50. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So, in the twinkling of an eye, as like quick as you can blink your eyes. Wow. That's pretty quick, right? Right. Okay? That's when the rapture is going to happen. That's, it, it's going to be that quick, okay? So, and people go... Oh, yeah, well, I'll just wait, you know, and I'll get my life together with the Lord later, <laughs> and it'll all be good, and I'll be with Him, and all that stuff. If it's going to happen in the blink of an eye, you're not going to have any time to do anything. Right. I've also heard people say, yeah, you know, I'll just stick around and, you know, go through the Great Tribulation, mm -hmm. and when it comes time for people to get their heads cut off, <laughs> or take the mark of the beast, I'll get my head cut off. Wow. And you know what? You know how I reply to that? Because I've heard some young guys say that before. Uh -huh. And they're like, I'll get my new life together later. I, I, I basically tell them, if you don't have enough guts to live for Jesus today, Amen. Right? you're not going to have enough guts to die for him later. Amen. <laughs> thought I'd let you know. Amen. So you're going to probably cop out and take the mark. And un it's really unfortunate. Okay, because a lot of people think that they have that ability. Okay? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, uh, we'll start off in verse 13. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. It says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Now what's interesting about that is that in Revelation, a trumpet was blown and then John went up, right? So that kind of connects with this, yep. just letting you know. <clears throat> and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Very powerful. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar was, like I said, he was losing his mind because these guys would not bow to him. Right. <clears throat> so he decided to throw them into the fiery furnace. So now we're going to go back to Gen Daniel chapter 3. We're going to pick up the story in verse... 19. It says, because these guys just said, we are not going to worship you. We are not going to bow down to you as a false god. We worship the real god. Amen. Right? So, in verse 19, <clears throat> it says, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. 
And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning furnace. Verse 21. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, we're talking exceedingly hot, we're not talking about Las Vegas when it's 115, <laughs> or Phoenix when it's 120, we're talking really hot, right? This furnace was really hot. Look at what it says here. <clears throat> Therefore, because of the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Burned up the guys who were throwing them into the furnace. They got torched. These are mighty men of Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> and you need to see that, okay? <coughs> Very powerful. Because <coughs> a lot of times we hear that story and we don't, <coughs> excuse me, we don't understand that the fire was so hot that it burned up the people that were throwing them into the fire. Mm -hmm. We can just read right past that and not get it. So, pretty intense. It says, the, I'm going to read verse 22 again. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, again, they turned up the heat, cut some of the biggest guys around, they tied up the three Hebrews, tossed them right into the middle of the fiery furnace, and the fire was so hot that it killed the guys that were tossing them in. They became overcome by the fire, and they were killed by it. That's pretty intense, right? Amen. And again, you know, like I said, sometimes we read through stories in the Bible, and we just go, oh, that's a nice little story, until we read all the details, and then we go, good grief. <laughs> this was really intense. Really intense. So, now... We're going to see what took place after that. Look at verse 23. And it says, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not throw three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Guess who was in the fire with them? Jesus. Isn't that powerful? Amen. <laughs> okay. Now, it, it, you know, as we again, as we read through these things, we're like, how can this be? I want you to think about your life. Have you ever gone through fiery trials? God promises that we will go through fiery trials. Yeah. He promises that. I, I don't really like that promise that well, that much. <laughs> okay, not too crazy about that one. But as we see what happened to these three faithful Hebrew men, we are reminded of a couple of things. Number one, the fire didn't burn them. Right. It freed them. <laughs> they were thrown in bound, and the only thing that was burned was the rope that held them. And the other thing is a much bigger blessing. There was a fourth person in the furnace. 
who looked like the Son of God. And like I said, it was Jesus, the Son of God, okay? And it's actually called a theophany, okay? A theophany is an appearance of God in the Old Testament. Wow. Okay? In some places, he was called the angel of the Lord. Here, it's calling him out for who he is, the Son of God. One like the Son of God. So much like the Son of God, he was the Son of God. Amen. <laughs> okay? That's very powerful. And again, you know, a lot of times we read through the stories and we go, oh yeah, that's pretty wild, that's pretty intense. But as we see this as a theophany, and like I said, in other places in the Old Testament, it talks about the angel of the Lord appearing, okay? And he wrestled with Jacob, okay? And knocked his hip out of socket and all that. The angel of the Lord also appeared when <coughs> Balaam <coughs> was yelling at his donkey and telling him to, you know, go. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord and didn't want to go. And Balaam was hitting the donkey with his stick. And it says that the angel of the Lord was there with flaming swords. Wow. So the donkey was protecting yep. the guy <laughs> from getting taken up by the angel of the Lord. That's wow. pretty intense, right? Wow. So again, I mean, you know, as, again, as we read through this stuff, we're going to go through trials. But isn't it a blessing to know that Jesus will be with us Amen. when we go through the trials. And how many have been in any trials in the last week, month, year? Every day. A couple of years. Okay. Isn't it comforting to know that Jesus will be with you? Amen. It certainly is. And so, again, so Nebuchadnezzar is the one that saw the fourth guy in the fire. It says, Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. In my Bible, it's got capital S, capital G. Mm -hmm. So it's talking about Jesus. So powerful. Then, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, Starts praising God again. But before we go there, I want to I want to take you to the book of Isaiah for a minute, because there's a very powerful verse in Isaiah that we need to take a look at. It's in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. It says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Isn't that intense? So, it, again, correlation, connection, they connect again, like we saw previously. And uh, like I said, the the 144,000, we're going to go over there for a minute. Oh, right on. Right on. <clears throat> so that we can talk about that as well. Not the, um... And that's in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. We're going to look at verse... So, where'd it go here? Got it right there. Revelation chapter 7. We're going to begin reading in verse 4. And it says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 
12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. And of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. So, this tells us exactly who they are. <laughs> because like I said, a lot of people go, oh yeah, the 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. Not. Amen. Okay. And or, it's basically talking about male virgins, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Wow. Times 12 is 144,000. Wow. And they are going to be protected by God. Okay? And it's not the church, it's Israel. Wow. So right. And uh, God knows who they are and where they are. Amen. Okay? And they will be sealed and protected from the Antichrist Amen. in the end times. Isn't that powerful? Right. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Pretty amazing. Thank you. <clears throat> anyway. In uh, let me grab another scripture here. I I love digging through this stuff because there's so much there's so much in it. It just spells it out. In uh, First Peter chapter four, First Peter chapter four talks about fiery trials. First Peter chapter four, beginning in verse twelve. It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Guess what the trials do in our lives? They purify us. Amen. Okay? And they definitely help us draw closer to God. Don't they? Amen. When you're going through trials, do you draw closer to God? Or do you get farther away from Him? I don't know about you, but it's a good idea to get closer to him when you're going through the trials. Amen? Amen. It's so important. All right. We're going to go back to, we're going to be finishing this puppy off. We're going to go back to Daniel chapter 3. Only a few more verses left. And picking it up in verse 26, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke saying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego servants of the most high God come out and come here then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out, came from the midst of the fire verse 27 and the satraps, administrators governors and kings, counselors gathered together and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power the hair of their head was not singed nor were their garments affected and the smell of fire was not on them wow so they're in the fire with jesus <laughs> they come out of the fire nobody got burned nobody's hair got singed nobody's beards got singed nothing got singed wow. they didn't even smell like Fire. Wow. Is that a miracle of God? You Amen. bet. Amen. Absolutely. Supernatural. All right. Picking it up in verse 28. This is, again, where it gets kind of crazy. It says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, here he goes back to, blessed be the God of Meshach, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word, his own word, and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speak, which speaks anything amid, amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces. 
and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. How about that, right? Wow. So this guy went from <laughs> saying, which God is going to deliver you from me? He just found out, right? Amen. The real God of heaven and earth. Then it says, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. I got a couple more scriptures wow. that I want to share with you that are very powerful. Okay, you guys okay with that? I'm sorry. Sorry. A couple of minutes Thank late. You. We can hang for a couple of minutes here. Uh, when we talk about that the church won't be on earth when the great tribulation happens, we will be viewing it from heaven. Amen. Where we'll be with the Lord. So when could that happen? Could happen right before the great tribulation. Right before. Wow. In uh, Second Thessalonians, we're going to go over there and got just a few more scriptures to look at here, but this is very powerful. Second Thessalonians, beginning in in uh, chapter two. Let me get over there. Second Thessalonians, beginning in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Gathering together to him. When will that take place? When the rapture happens. We will gather together to him. Okay? Second Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about it. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition. Those are all titles for the Antichrist, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we are gathered together to the Lord first, then the falling away and you know what? We can see examples of the falling away now. <laughs> that there are a lot of churches that talk about Jesus. There are a lot of different groups that talk about Jesus. And they don't even know. Amen. Okay? And they have a different gospel than the real gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay? They'll tell you how you can be wonderful. <laughs> How you be? You are the most wonderful person, and you can be the best that you can be, and you know, and days of purpose, and days of this, and days of that, and all kinds of stuff. And you know, a couple of names come to mind, but we won't talk about them. But they're on TVN, okay? And some of the guys, they're they're motivational speakers, but they're not pastors, Amen. and they tell you. That you can be the best you that you can be. And everybody's going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Is that true? No. No. No way. Otherwise, Jesus would not have come to die for the sins of the world. Amen. And they say that everybody's going to be in heaven. doesn't matter which God you believe in. Any path will get you there. In fact, one of the popes was recently saying that. It <laughs> doesn't matter what faith you're in. Oh, you can just, you know, as long as you believe in God, you're probably going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That's up. pretty intense. <clears throat> so again, it says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, so that he as God, he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So like I said, in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple, say, hey, you guys can't worship 
the God of Israel anymore. Now you're going to worship me. Wow. And by the way, you're going to take the mark of the beast or you're going to die. It's pretty wow. intense. Wow. And then it says, do you not remember? Again, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. Verse 7 is really interesting. It says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, capital H on he, he who now restrains will do so until he, capital H, he, is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, on and on and on. So it's talking about what is restraining the Antichrist from coming. It's real simple. The real church. The Holy Spirit in the church. Because guess what? If the Antichrist came on the scene right now, all of us would be pointing and going, that's not God. <laughs> Amen. Don't take the mark. Don't worship him. Amen. Right? Amen. None of us would be saying, oh yeah, this is God. Worship him. It's all good. Mm -hmm. Don't even go there. Amen. <clears throat> and like I said, I want to talk about this just for a minute. Because there are some words in the Bible that, because, you know, you'll, you'll have people that will say, there is no word in the Bible, rapture. Rapture is not in the Bible. I want to tell you which words are in the Bible. The words caught up are a translation of the Greek word harpazo. And this word harpazo means to be snatched away or taken up by force. The force of God's spirit at the call of Jesus. We will be caught up together Amen. to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? Also, there's another word in Latin, and it is rapturus. And that one sounds pretty close to rapture, doesn't it? Amen. The word rapturus means basically the same Amen. thing, that you're going to be caught Amen. up together with him Amen. in the air. Wow. And so, you know, you can hear people, oh, the word rapture is not in the Bible. It is if you know Latin and you know Greek. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because it's the same term, Amen. caught up. Translation of the Greek word harpazo and also the, the Latin word rapturus. Very intense. Okay. Uh, I got to share this with you because this is powerful. Then we're going to be out of here. I promise. We're, we're getting close. Okay. Coming soon to a theater near us. The, the Bible talks about what is going to take place, and it is the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1 it says, Concerning the times. And the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. You know, during the tribulation, the first three and a half years, they're going, they're going to say, hey, the Antichrist is a good guy. He's a ruler that we've all been looking for. Mm -hmm. He made peace and safety wow. come to our world. And guess what? It says right here, <clears throat> verse 3, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And so it, it talks about watching and being ready. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 5 of that same chapter. It says, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. 
We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So it's very important as Christians that we are watching and waiting for Jesus. Amen. Okay? Because it's coming down to a theater near us quicker than Amen. Quicker than you. <laughs> I mean, it's Blink of an eye said. It really is. It's coming down faster than most people think. And, you know, a lot of people just don't get it. I've talked to people about the, the, the coming, the second coming of Christ. And they go, well, he came as a baby. And then when he comes again, it's going to be at the end of the book of Revelation. But it doesn't, it doesn't bring into play the rapture that takes place in between the three and a half years. Okay? And so at the beginning of the tribulation, I believe that we will be taken up. Amen. Okay? The great tribulation. Not just tribulation. <clears throat> I got just a couple more quick verses. Right. right. Luke chapter 21. <clears throat> Luke chapter 21. We'll begin in verse 17 through 19. And it talks about what the world is going to be like. Luke chapter 21, verse 17, it says, You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost by your patience. Possess your souls. By your patience, possess your souls. So Jesus is saying that he's going to be with us, right? Mm -hmm. Also, in 21, verse 20, this is really interesting. It says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Okay? Do we see anything like that going on in our time? Amen. Right it is popping off, folks. Amen. Okay? And then finally, wow. in Luke chapter 21, verse 25 through 36, <clears throat> coming of the Son of Man. It says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from, the, from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Wow. Very, very intense. Okay. <laughs> then it talks about the parable of the fig tree. Um We'll read through that quickly. The fig tree is Israel. Okay, just to let you know. Mm -hmm. It's in verse 29. It says, Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees when they are already budding. You see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, the things that we just read about, right? Mm -hmm. Know that the kingdom of God is near. As surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will be, pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life. And that day comes on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare. On all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Wow. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Amen. Very intense. Amen. So while the world is in party mode <laughs> Amen. and just doing whatever the world does, yep. we gotta stay sober. Amen. We gotta be paying attention, watching waiting, preparing. Amen? Amen. Because Jesus is
coming again. Amen. And we need, I don't know about you, but I sure want to be counted worthy to escape all the stuff that's coming. Amen. Right? Absolutely. So let's close with prayer. All right. Father God, thank you that you have such a powerful word. And as we read through it, we can just see the dots connecting, God. We can see the pieces of the puzzles, puzzle coming together. And God, many of us believe that you could come at any moment. And so we ask you to forgive us, to help us. Help us to stand strong. To keep our faith in you and not in this world. This world has no hope without you, Jesus. And help us to be sold out for your kingdom's sake. We love you. We ask you to help us to draw closer to you, to read, to pray, to trust you. Because this world is going to roll up like a scroll. And God, we just pray that you would be with us and help us to draw closer to you. Help us to also continue to share our faith with our loved ones. Help us to stand up for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though this world doesn't even want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Help us to be bold. Help us to stand up for our faith and help us to tell those that we love that Jesus is coming again. We love you. We give you honor. We give you praise. Give us your strength to stand strong in the days that we live in. And for those that are out there in Facebook land or in this room, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to do that because time is short. And if you pray to accept Christ before, but you're not really living for him, then ask him to forgive you. Ask him to help you. Ask him to give you his strength so that you can walk with him and draw closer to him. Rededicate your life to him and say, Jesus, I love you. I need you. I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to wash me clean by your precious blood. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. And when I die or when you return to your church, help me to be ready. God, I love you. I give you honor. I give you praise. And I thank you that you came and died for me. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.